Yeah, so I mean, James has actually said the, the most important bits uh, that I wanted to say, uh, but I, I just going to reinforce the the message that I mean, this is supposed uh, to become our seminar in Sussex AI, uh, and this is the first one. Even though we had different seminars before, NLP seminars, we had the allergic seminars. Um, there is still also the COP seminars, which will continue. But these uh, these other seminars are kind of being bundled into the Sussex AI seminars, and we do want to run them regularly. So if you have anyone that you would want to invite, please invite them. And if it can't be on the Wednesday, we can arrange. Yeah. So it's, it's important that we all get involved, invite people down, speak ourselves. Uh, we still have a slot available in two weeks' time if someone is uh, interested. Um, and then for sure, we're going to start for real um, in the new year. And that's the one, yeah, the one thing I wanted to emphasize. I thought that otherwise James has said everything. And I don't want to bore you with any more uh, admin facts or figures. So we're just going to go right into doing a bit of science. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today is um, something that I've been doing, I've been starting to do for the last two years or so. Uh, because I was lucky enough when I stepped down as a director of research, they gave me a bit of uh, free time of less teaching. And so I tried, tried to start up a bit of something new that I hadn't done before. Um, and the motivation behind doing this kind of work uh, is, if you want to just put it uh, in, in pictures, is this problem that when we're doing AI today, especially large language models, uh, stuff that's based on transformer architectures, you need a lot of energy uh, to, to, to train your models, also to run your models, but mainly to train them. And just for the fun of it, for a different talk, I, uh, I asked being an image creator, which of course is one of these models that take a lot of energy, to make me this illustration, right? And so you see the bing pong there and what it came up with there, which is uh, it's kind of good fun. Uh, but the problem is real. So if you look at the data, then uh, you can see these trends where the energy and uh, the compute need, needed by, for sheet, uh, by different models uh, is just increasing over time. So it's a log scale and we have kind of linear fits there. So meaning stuff is growing exponentially. Uh, and if that wasn't bad enough, uh, the kind of transformer architectures have a really bad exponent now uh, for the how they go exponentially, right? So there's this number of 750 times larger every two years. And this clearly can't continue. Yeah? We, are, we are at a point where they're already using uh, vast amounts of time in, in data centers. If you just go 10 years further, let's say, that would be kind of the energy consumption of the whole planet. So we can't go like that forever. Yeah? So there's, there's, we're already kind of pushing the limit. Uh, so the question is, uh, is that the only way how you can do AI? Is there some other way how we can do AI? Um, and obviously, we all have one of these things in our head, and they use about 15 watts, uh, whereas these modern models use in the order of kilo to megawatts. I didn't precisely put the numbers down here, but you get the drift. Yeah. So there is some other way of doing AI, uh, or I, <laughs> intelligence. And, and, and we want to... Uh, one of the, the motivations for what I do is we want to find these ways and then build different hardware, potentially. I wouldn't build the hardware myself, but someone might build different hardware to then do AI differently. Now, for getting this inspiration functional, we need to have a look how our brains different than modern AI algorithms. And to put it very simply here, there are three aspects for they're different, uh, there are more, but uh, these are some important ones. Yeah, so. The, the brains are built on this electrochemical wet way, I called it, so they're not made out of silicon and wires, uh, whereas you know, the hardware we're using today is traditional computer hardware, so we're looking at GPUs, CPUs, and so on. It's all metal oxide hardware with metal wires. Um, the other thing that's very important and that also interests me is that the brains are evolved and embodied, so brains don't work on their own in some corner in the box, but they work because they drive a body that then drives the sensory input and you have this closed loop interaction with an environment. And that allows you to do things completely differently than you would be doing it if you separated compute completely from sensing, completely from action, like you typically still do in, in robots and machines. Whereas the, the AI we use otherwise is typically built for machine learning um, and it's, it's more like a statistics engine and that's not quite how the brain works, even though there might be aspects of that as well, and, and people 
obviously work in these areas as well. And then the, the third one I highlighted here, sparse communication with spikes. That's this idea that in the brain, all the neurons communicate only occasionally with a spike rather than all the time, like in a, in a traditional artificial neural network model. But you just transmit the activation of each unit to each other unit that's connected every time step, if you think in time step based uh, simulations. And, and that's the kind of one I want to talk about today. Yeah. So, um, can we save a lot of energy potentially by doing more these spiking neural networks than the artificial neural networks that are currently mostly used? So that's the, the kind of motivation introduction bit. And now I want to do actually deep right into the somewhat technical stuff. Because one of the problems we have is uh, that we don't really know, we know how to formulate spiking neural networks. So maybe I should just show that first. Yeah, so uh, when you formulate a spiking neural network, the most common way of doing this is saying that we use these so-called integrate and fire neurons. So we have a variable which represents in a sense the potential of the neuron, uh, V for voltage. And it uh, has this differential equation where it just kind of decays towards zero, um, then nothing happens. And if they get an input current, then it is pushed up or down by the input current. And whenever then, uh, so that's the integrate bit, and the leaky integrated fire is the leak bit. Um, and then whenever this voltage is above a certain threshold in one of the neurons, so I numbered it here with uh, index i, um, then we emit a spike, and that means that only at that point I have an interaction with the other neurons, J. And what I do is I add this weight from I to J onto the current of neuron J. Yeah, so just occasionally when I get above threshold, I add this extra input to the other neuron into its input current. And these currents also, they're just leaky uh, integrators, right? So the current then decays over time exponentially, like like this equation shows. And that's the whole idea of the network, right? So with that, we can now build a network. We can apply input currents. So we put into, uh, when we do a, a network, let's, let me show this. Uh, yeah, then we have something like, a, like input neurons uh, and then some other part of the network. Come to that in a moment. And if you want to then simulate something, then we put input currents in here. So the variables i that for each of these green circles exist, we, we put something into it. Um, and then we can simulate those equations with an uh, ODE solver, typically just an Euler algorithm where you just take derivative times time step to get the next uh, guess of your, your state variables. And you then iteratively can simulate that uh, and you, you get the activity of these, these networks. Then typically what you would want to do with it, I mean, this is one application, there are loads others, so you might want to do regression or other things, maybe generative things these days, but the, the, the most simple one, or one of the most simple ones, is just to recognize stuff. Uh, so that's the classification problem. And if I wanted to build with spiking neural networks a classification network, it would look a bit like this. So this is kind of the grandfather of classification problems. This is a digit from the endless handwritten digit data set. Uh, it was rasterized in 28 by 28 images. And now for doing it with spiking neural networks, I need to turn that into spikes, yeah, so into discrete events and a simple way of doing it is yeah, I just sample it row-wise into one vector, which would become this kind of y direction here. And then for each gray level, I determine the spike time just proportional to the gray level, for example. That's, well, maybe the log of the gray level, or some sort of encoding scheme like that. And so this number two here would then turn into a, a pattern like this, yeah, where the dark pixels spike early and the white pixels don't spike at all, and the gray ones somewhere in between, not that kind of thing. Right, and now I have everything I need. So for each of these spikes, when it occurs, I add to the input current of one of these neurons. Uh, I didn't show them in one line because it doesn't fit the slide, but you have 784, that's 28 by 28, yeah, which is this kind of dimension here. You put them in there, and then you simulate your network. Uh, and eventually what you would want is, uh, in a classification system like that, that on the output side, you could train it to activate neurons that represent the different inputs. So in this case, I have 10 output neurons here, zero to, uh, I don't know whether it says 20, but I, that was from a different thing. So it's 10, yeah, <laughs> zero to nine. And it should activate, if I put the two out here, it should activate the neuron number two, right? Zero, one, two. Um, and if I put it the nine, it should do nine and so on. That's the kind of simple scheme of how you can do classification with such a system. And all of that is a really old hack, no? And this is, people have done that for, for years. 
um, people have neuromorphic hardware where this can be done on hardware very efficiently. The only problem we're having, and that's what this talk is about, is that training these networks, finding the right weights, isn't the solved problem. We don't really know how to very efficiently do that. And just if you if you think back, what do we do uh, in artificial neural networks? The one thing that has prevailed in the end, people have tried loads of different things, like loads, but what has prevailed was gradient descent. Yeah, we de determine a loss function, so something that captures what we want the output to do. In this case, it's a very simple thing we could do. Is it's like this uh, um, normal cross entropy loss, basically where we kind of measure that the neuron that should be active is particularly high activity and the other ones are particularly low activity. I'll show some formula later, but that's the essence of a loss function, right? So this, this number would be particularly high if the wrong neurons on or several wrong neurons are on and the number would be very, very low if the right neurons on and the other neurons are off. Right? So, so a loss function like that. And if you have it, then you can uh, just calculate a gradient on the loss function, so the derivative of the loss function with respect to all these weight parameters. Of course, it's a bit of math to be done, but people know how to do that. Um, and you can do it on the computer automatically. Uh, automatically, maybe. <laughs> yeah, with autograd tools and so on. Uh, and then you can just say, okay, the, the gradient points in the direction that you imagine the loss as kind of a, a, a surface over all the parameters. So here show two parameters, but typically it would be a million or, or maybe a billion or so dimensional space. And that loss landscape kind of is, uh, is, is above that. And I want to get to the point where it's particularly low. Then I can just follow this gradient and it will kind of go down uh, for each calculation I make. It can go down a step and then we calculate again and so on and so on. And eventually you end in the minimum and that these weight values are good to make the loss low, which means these are good to make the network do what you want it to do. And that's fantastic. And it works in artificial neural networks and has been the bread and butter um, for, for years and years. And interestingly, has never been really replaced. And so everyone does gradient descent. The problem now is that with spiking neural networks, um, unfortunately, you have spikes that communicate things. I mean, it's good because it saves energy, but it's bad because it makes things non-differentiable. So at points, it's not impossible to just naively calculate these gradients. It just doesn't work. Uh, <clears throat> and this has uh, bamboozled people for a long time. And since it has been taking, if you think neural networks were started then like 1950s, 60s, if you look at the really early stuff, um, it has taken to 2002 around before people got some working solutions to that problem. And it started with something called spike prop. Um, and then people have kind of layered onto this in the last 20 years. And just in the last two, three years, there was a lot of excitement about new methods of doing this with so-called silver gradients and also new methods of doing it with exact gradients. And one of them I wanted to show you uh, here, which is called event prop. Um, and this is something where uh, uh, two PhD students, really, uh, or, or one might have been already a postdoc in Heidelberg, came up with this, where they looked, they were physicists by training, and they looked at the physics literature and at optimization literature, kind of old math journals, really, and found that this problem of having to optimize uh, a loss function isn't new. I mean, this is optimization theory all over, written all over it. And this kind of system of having spiking neural networks, not called spiking neural networks, but hybrid networks of ODEs with events, actually was also something people had thought about before. And they managed to, to apply this whole uh, theory that existed, to extract it from the literature and apply it to spiking neural networks that allowed them to find a scheme to very efficiently calculate gradients now for these spiking neural networks. Which, uh, which seems amazing because it, they don't seem to be so unhandleable. But it turns out if you have a loss that has a particular form that looks like this, then you can do it. And what's, what's the shape here that's important? It's basically that the uh, loss is a function either, they call it T post, but it's essentially the spike times. So you have some sort of function of the time of the spike, not of the voltage itself that's, that jumps and is non-differentiable but the time when it happens. And that's a quantity that actually is differentiable with respect to the weights, interestingly. 
or you have an integral over some function of the voltage, having that integral allows you to trade off the non-differentiable things with the derivatives and the integration in a way that it becomes handleable. Okay. And I'm not going to say more than this. The, the original paper has some sort of three to five pages appendix where they explain how it actually works. And, um, and I have a digested version of that. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to share, which is more like 20 pages. But, but they really go per detail what, what you need to kind of make this magic happen. But the upshot of it is, is something like this. And I apologize for people who are not so keen on formula for this slide. It's got less formula heavily in a moment. But, but I just wanted to show for everyone else who is keen um, that this is a really nice scheme. So if you look at how it works, it's basically that um, because of this adjoint method, what you have is two systems. You have a system of differential equation that defines the network, and that's written here, slightly different notation than I had at the beginning. But this is essentially, again, just your uh, voltages that integrate over time. Uh, you get input currents, and then the input currents is, uh, is uh, augmented by the weight times uh, the spike vector, so to speak, when, when one of the neurons spikes. And you can formulate it in, in, in this way. So that's the forward pass, that's the old hat that I talked about. And now to calculate the gradient, what you have is this adjoint systems of equations, which again are differential equations that look very, very similar. If you compare, these equations are almost the same. Yeah, If you look at the lambda v equation, um, and the lambda i equation, these are these adjoint variables. And um, if you know about these things, so these have to do, uh, these are uh, Lagrange multipliers, yeah? And that's where the lambda kind of comes from. Um, but if you don't know about this, don't worry about it. The, the upshot is that you have another system of equations where you integrate something very similar to what this is, also with these jumps, and don't look at the details, this is really ugly. But the, um, the actual, gradient just then becomes the sum of these variables, yeah, these lambda i variables. So it means you have now two systems. One goes forward in time, the other one goes backward in time. So this prime here is the derivative backwards in time, this is the here forwards in time, d, d, t. But otherwise, a similar system that you integrate and you get your gradient as the sum of these variables, which is a completely uh, efficient way to calculate this compared to anything else people have been doing. Anything else people have been doing was calculated per sign signups. Yeah, that was variables in the signups that need to be tra tracked, uh, and, and where you had to integrate over and so on. This one is per neuron, and you just have these equations that look exactly like the forward ones. So we already have technology to still simulate them very efficiently in our bag. And we just do that and we get the gradient almost for free, so to speak. So this is really, was really exciting to me, especially because we are at Sussex, and, and most of you know this, but um, Jamie and I, we are in the business of simulating these kind of networks efficiently on GPUs. So now we knew to do that forward with this thing, we also know to do it backwards. And so we have now a very efficient system um, of <clears throat> learning the spiking neural networks. So for those of you who don't know, I wanted to actually mention it briefly. Yeah, so this, Software we use is called Gen GPU Enhanced Neural Networks. This is, we had to come up with some name at some point. We looked at something maybe that sounds like a name, right? So that, that where Gen came from. Um, but what it does is basically it takes your description of a neural model, and it could be more computational neuroscience detailed, but it can also just be these integrated fire networks. And then uh, you can train them very efficiently on a GPU without knowing much about GPUs because the software is built by Jamie and does all the, the heavy lifting in the middle, okay? And and in the meantime, since we invented this, uh, we've also built this whole ecosystem around it, and so people can use all kinds of Python-based uh, frameworks uh, to go and input their models into this and then get the efficient simulations out of it. Uh, it's a bit of a beast, but it actually works uh, very, very nicely. Right, so... We have all that there, so we could say, okay, now I'm finished. Uh, yeah, 23 minutes, fine, good, everything's good. Now we can solve any kind of classification problem, everything's good. And uh, for a moment, I thought, yeah, it could be amazing, right? So I tried it, and I went right in there, um, and I chose the network I showed you, very simple, with one hidden layer. I tried to classify MNIST, uh, the, the first thing any kind of machine learner would do, right? Um, and so um, I went ahead and did that. There was also another benchmark that was in the original paper. I, can, I was able to reproduce that. That was fine. Um, 
I mean, there's a loss function, I use this function here, just uh, I promised you the formula earlier. So that's a, one of these typical loss functions, um, which is cross entropy loss. Uh, if you want to see whether it makes sense, uh, just imagine, so this VLM M there, yeah, that's the kind of correct neurons voltage um, for the trial um, M, yeah? So L is the number of the neuron. Uh, and so if, if that one voltage is high here and all the other voltages that are summed up here are low, then the, the best you can do when is, if this is extremely high and these are extremely low, because this is included in the sum, you will approach you know, towards one in the bracket. And then the log of one is about zero, uh, yeah, and then uh, you get zero loss, which is great. Yeah? That's what you want. And whenever this voltage isn't particularly high and these other voltages are high, then you get higher values. Yeah? With the minus sign here in the front, you, the log will be negative and you get high loss values. So this kind of works, right? This is a very good loss function. And additionally, it's in the right shape for event prop because I needed something as an integral over time of a function of the voltage. And that's a function of the voltage, right? So we'll be doing okay. So this could all be done. I stuck it in there and implemented it in gen. It works very nicely. And you get, uh, there's an example of a digit again, and then you get these results. And you can see you get some sort of 99% training error, uh, 98 evaluation error, and then if you do testing, um, you get about, yeah, 97 point something. So this isn't amazing for, for MNIST, but it isn't bad. It's, it's, you know, it's an okay performance, I'd say. So at that point, I thought, oh, everything's fantastic. I'll just continue. Let's do the real problems, right? And one of the, the ones I, I thought they just came out two, two, three years earlier and they sounded fun, uh, was speech recognition. Okay. So I went on to do speech recognition. Oh, I should mention this, I forgot, yeah. It trains also very quick. That was the whole story about Gen being efficient with these networks and this method being really good for Gen. So I can train 15 epochs uh, in about 27 seconds on a normal PC with a good graphics card, but yeah, still. Right? So that's quite quick. Yeah? When I started this business, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, we were using clusters overnight to do a similar thing. So, so things have changed a bit. Um, Right. So I, I thought move on to something more real and do speech recognition as this uh, data set called spiking Heidelberg digits. And basically people went into a sound studio and they were speaking digits into a microphone. They were saying zero, 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 that one, 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 and so on. They had 12 people do that. It was basically the whole research group there. So they <laughs> were sent all into the sound studio. They had to speak their bits. Um, and then they turned them into spikes with a, a cochlear model. And this is the one that has 20 classes because people had to do it in German and in English. Yeah. So they go null, 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 and then zero, 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 and then eins, 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 and so on. Um, yeah. So, so this is a bit harder because, uh, now these, uh, digits, they last on by uh, between a second and 1.4 seconds or so and have a real time structure. People showed that if you just kind of flatten them into kind of a, pa a, 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 a spatial pattern of which channel is active, this is a bit like a, because we're done with a cochlear model, this is a bit like uh, Fourier frequencies. Yeah, so like this is like a spectrogram. Uh, this is high frequency followed by some low frequency here and extra low at the end and so on. And um, if you just compacted this all or you swiveled it in, in time, you can't recognize them, right? So this, the time structure over this whole second and each neurons are spiking so on all matters to recognize the digits nicely. So it's slightly harder than the endless one where it's really just about which pixels on, which is much easier. Um, so, so I thought this is good. Yeah. And, um, I stuffed it in. It, there wasn't any more work to do. It was the same kind of network and the same kind of encoding, right? You have spikes and all good. And what I observed was this. There was absolutely, there was no zero performance. It just had chance level performance. So 20 classes, as I said, so 5% success by chance, just guessing. And that's exactly what I was getting, 5%. And it wouldn't budge from there. And I was a bit disappointed. <laughs> Suffice to say. So, so let's, um, let's see what's going on. Uh, it took me like, uh, quite a while. I, I was kind of looking at all kinds of things. I thought I had bugs in the code, this or that. Um, but I, you know, I, I couldn't find it. And then eventually, uh, I did find out what was, what was happening. But did you want to ask a question? No. Sorry, Paul, you were doing like, no. no it's good. <laughs> it's good. 
Um, so, so I was, I was uh, just to, to, to recap what we're doing. Yeah, so I had this network. So now it's indeed 20 outputs. Yeah, I, I must have stolen the picture for the other one and then didn't update the numbers. Um, and uh, I had this cross entropy loss that I showed you. Uh, and then um, I was training with this. And I found out that what the problem was, was quite an intricate kind of mishap that was happening inside. But it reflected on something very fundamental about training spiking neural networks, where we go full circle again, that there is actually still problems, even though you have these advanced algorithms now. And so I tried to explain this kind of step by step, and I hope it makes some sense to you. Yeah, and um, I put some picture later, maybe that also helps a bit. So what I was um, observing was the following things: this cross entropy loss. Um, by design, it has a diminishing return for increasing voltage uh, even when it's already high. So if I'm already doing very well, uh, the way this function is, is shaped with the log of the exponentials divided by each other, if I just add a bit more to the right voltage and subtract the time with less, uh, more again, I guess, subtract more from the other voltages, if it's already good, I don't get much better. Yeah? I'm already close to zero, and it's kind of kind of saturating there. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so that's one thing that happens, and that's not necessarily a problem. That's fine, and it's on purpose too. You don't want to overlearn, right? So once it's already doing correct, you don't make much weight changes. So this is all good, but it's something to keep in mind for what's coming next. Yeah. Um, now the other thing that happens is that if you speak digits, you're first quiet, then you speak something, and then you're quiet again. So in terms of the spikes, there's no spikes, some spikes, and then no spikes. And accordingly, the output neurons would have all voltages equal, which is high loss, which is bad, classify, and then they would get better or worse if they're badly trained. Yeah, But then they do something because there are spikes, and then they stop doing something, and they're bad again because they're all equal, and you know there's no input, and this is just in, in kind of um, doing nothing mode. Yeah, But then a typical loss but you haven't learned anything yet, looks like this. Yeah, so loss is already bad in the beginning, and then it gets worse, right, where the spikes are, and then it gets, you know, a bit better, but still bad back here. So, so far, nothing amazing, but that just, you know, I'm building up here. And then, um, now when I learn, what do I do? Well, I will uh, reduce the loss by increasing weights between hidden and output neurons that should be active. Uh, and decreasing weights and hidden to output neuron that shouldn't be active. Right? And that all was happening. I checked that, right? So that's good. Yeah. So you're doing the right thing there. Fine. Now, the other way I can reduce the loss is by changing now the input to hidden layer weights. And that's where the magic is in such a network. You have a middle layer because you want to transform more than just linearly. So not just the output weights in this obvious way I just said, but also you want to get representations in the hidden layer that are good to learn what you need to learn. So you're changing those weights. And in terms of the spikes that you observe here, and this is where it starts becoming interesting. Yeah, you observe here, um, I could actually make the loss better by moving what I call helpful spikes. So spikes and hidden units that would drive the right output neuron because they have all the high weights onto that output neuron. So if I move those spikes a bit earlier, yeah, then I would get more bang for my buck. This comes back to this first point. Yeah, so um, I, I might be able to do something better here if I move them forward. Or equal, equally, maybe I need to move them backward to get rid of this big bulge here where I can still make a lot of impact and then the front I can't as much. But you can kind of see that moving spikes around is the game here in the uh, in terms of, of event prop. Um, that, yeah, so by moving spikes in the hidden layer to areas where I can get more reduction of the loss, yeah, that would help me um, make the loss lower in addition to doing the stuff on the output layer. Right, that's so, so far so good. I mean, that's okay, that's what you do, fine. Um, now, <clears throat> if you move spikes to a later point, and in some uh, circumstances, that's what you need to do to reduce the loss, that means you need to reduce the input to hidden weights. Also still okay. Now that's it's intrinsic in how integrated fire neurons work, right? If you give less input, they spike later. You know, if you give a lot of input, they spike early. Great, fine. All of this, then no problem, right? Uh, but the problem that comes here is the, the fundamental big, yeah, the bummer. If you reduce weights 
too much, you're not moving the spike to later, you're deleting it. Now there's just not enough to drive the neuron and the spike just disappears. And that was the underlying problem that was happening here. Um, for whatever reasons, on average, the structure of these uh, digits is such, like the, the density of spikes is such, that I was moving more spikes to later than to earlier, and I was deleting them all. And all of this I explained was now the helpful spikes, right? So you can do the inverse story for the spikes that activate the wrong neurons. They should go the opposite way. Yeah? But in, in, in the balance, just stick with the helpful spikes. I was deleting helpful spikes by moving them to later on average. Some were moved left early, but some later. But on average, I was moving them later because how these digits are structured. They have many spikes early and then less later on average. So the whole thing was just an intricate detail of how this data set worked together that the uh, event prop wasn't guarding against deletion of spikes. They just disappear suddenly and you can't see it in the in the gradient. Yeah. So if you wanted a kind of caricature of what was happening, was this was the landscape was a little bit like this, where you go down the gradient and then you come to the point where it's really low there and it drives you right into this kind of cliff where it said spike deletion. Um, where basically when the spike goes away, the loss actually gets a lot higher because this was a helpful spike. It was supposed to excite the right neuron, right? To, to drive the right output. Um, and the problem is that, yeah, the shape was such that it kind of fell into that cliff because the, the landscape down there, the gradient always points down towards the cliff and the actual cliff's not visible, so to speak, in the gradient. You can go as tight as you want, the gradient will still point down. Yeah. And that's a fundamental problem with the, this nature of the uh, continuous and discrete system that we have. I think we have a question online, Carlo, if you want to unmute yourself and say something. Oh, we can't hear you, though. Hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was saying, I wanted to, to ask. Hold on for a sec. Can we go to the... Let me see that I can uh, get the audio device. Try again. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask, can this be due to how you solve the problem because using the Lagrangian multiplier equivalence, if you have the topology of learning which is redundant, in the case of audio, you may have the redundant uh, structure of the information. Then you ended up to solve an inverse problem in enough space. And so your solution gets, uh, you only see a projection of your solution, you don't see the full uh, uh, representation. And that's flatten your uh, gradients. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure I understand what you're after, but I, the the issue is not that the gradient is wrong, right? The the gradient is fine. It is the exact gradient, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that the discrete, the spike events, they are not included in this calculation. They just don't feature in it. Yes, but the gradient is a representation of the energy of your network. So if the energy of your network through the, uh, because you are representing with the Lagrange, if you get the Lagrange, you, the, how you can extract that energy, uh, and uh, you enter in a singularity, you flatten it. We, we observe this, for example, in robotics close to the singularity, similar behavior, where you get uh, the tangent space that completely loses uh, the scale, of the system. But this is, I mean, this isn't literally a Lagrangian, right? This is just the, the, um, the gradient of my arbitrary loss function here. So yeah, I'm not but sure whether this applies. What you said energy, is a redundant uh, representation of an energy. So if you have uh, something that you're trying to black propagate, you have the same concept, it's nonlinear. So you, you probably didn't see that with the writing because the writing data set was uh, less complex than the voice. Yeah, I think we need to take this offline, Carlo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, but we can talk about this later, okay? Yeah. All right. So let me let me continue um, with the, with the story as as I have it. So. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so, so the problem is, so, so once I understood this, I, I completely all made a lot more sense now. Um, because uh, basically I, I could see that I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was following the gradients, I was optimizing things, 
but I wasn't, there was an element in my model that wasn't captured by the whole gradient descent business. That was kind of fouling up my day, yeah, which, which this, this is essential to the spiking neural networks though, right? The idea of spikes and that they appear suddenly and disappear again. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, what's the solution to this then? And, um, I think, yeah. Uh, so I said, yeah, yeah, the look again, cannot see the cliff. The solution of this will be to, to manipulate my landscape so that I don't hit these things. But before I do that, I just want to show you some evidence that this interpretation, I mean, this is just a caricature made up. Yeah. This has nothing to do with the actual landscape, as you might be able to tell from it being two dimensional. I just made this picture up to illustrate. Um, but I have some evidence that this was happening. And this is, this one is part of the evidence. I just thought I showed it here. Um, if you just compared uh, for a given input type, yeah, for a given class, and I just trained this one class. It should have been super easy, yeah. So I just gave zeros. Let's say I, I can't remember which one I took, but it might well be have been zeros. So spoken zeros, and it just had to activate the zeroth neuron. No problem of distinguishing different ones. It should be a super easy task. It failed to do that. But then I then I made these observations on <clears throat> the weights and the average rate, I said here, the number of spikes made by hidden units. So I would look uh, at the hidden neurons and their weight onto the correct output neuron. Oh yeah, it says output zero, so I took the zero. Yeah. And then I sorted the hidden neurons by that weight. So the ones that had the highest weight in the output zero, which was the correct output, yeah, that's a very helpful neuron, so to speak, yeah, because that would activate the right output. Um, that is on top, and the ones that are most less least helpful, yeah, that actually suppress the correct output neuron at the bottom. And then you look at the number of spikes. There are two representations here as a spike raster, uh, uh, or as an average rate over many trials. That's for one trial, that's for many trials. You can see that basically the ones that should be representing the, uh, the number because they have the highest weight onto the right output neuron are not active. So kind of the hidden layer and the output connectivity were working against each other. Yeah? One was learning that certain neurons were good to have for this type of input and then activate the right neuron. So you take the weight up. You have the result of that on the left. And then that neuron was consecutively switched off <laughs> and never res responded to that input. It should be responding to very strongly, right? So they were completely working in the opposite direction. And that meant that I couldn't learn anything uh, because the two elements of the network were going in the opposite direction. So what's the solution then uh, to, to solve this problem? Well, uh, the solution is uh, in the details of how this network, um, the, how the loss landscape of this network looks like uh, when there are these spike deletions. Yeah, so this was the problem. I'm not sure why I completely have this slide twice, but okay. And this is the solution. So who can spot the difference? What might have changed? Yes. So the landscape is going to up before the change. That's exactly it. Yeah. So I, I manipulated the loss uh, function and I'll show you how it looks like in a moment. So that down at the cliff, we're not leading into the cliff like this, but rather the, we might go up into cliff. That means the gradient would never go there, right? So if I now do the gradient on this, down there, then uh, it just goes around and to some sort of minimum, but it would never go right into the cliff because it's uphill, you know? And that you can see, right? Everything that's smooth is in the gradient. So you can save yourself from deleting spikes. Yeah, so uh, just to summarize the, the, the main message then, yeah, the, um, the underlying problem, the essential problem here was that um, I wanted something which was correct outputs and I made the loss function to lead me there with gradient descent. But of course, this loss function had elements to it that induced changes that actually weren't helpful for that at all. Yeah? Together with not being able to see when spikes appear or disappear, um, and then asking this thing where essentially how I've done it, I wanted to classify during the whole trial, right? I wanted to have the voltage high at all points, yeah? with, with the cross entropy was calculated at all points and integrated over. Also, when there were no spikes, yeah. So this was a bit maybe pig headed, yeah. Like to to uh, to put the loss function like that, but that led to all these problems. If you if you look at the big picture here, yeah. So the combination of not being able to see spike deletions 
and having chosen a loss that actually pushed me into spike deletions because I was trying to optimize something I don't need to optimize and can't, where you know, it can't optimize the loss where there's no input. How, how would it do that, right? The voltages will be zero there. That there's no, there's no way to do it, right? So it was doing these artificial things to create activity where there was none and, and all of that, right? And that was behind the, the problem. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how did I, how to solve the thing? So very quickly, um, yeah, I needed to do something um, with a loss function that actually only reflects what I wanted to do, which was to classify these, di these spoken digits correctly. So I wanted to just, on average, have the voltage of the correct neuron high and of the others low, and not any kind of particular uh, low or high voltages at particular times or anything like it. So I turned it around and I said, okay, um, instead of having this loss here, which was my original attempt, yeah, I would do the loss like this. And if you spot the difference, it's just the integral has kind of migrated inside. And now I'm just doing the cross entropy of the average voltage. And now it doesn't matter where the voltage is high, as long as high somewhere and makes a nice high integral, everything's great. Yeah? So it is a much, much less restrictive loss function. I'm trying to do much less, but it's good enough for classification, obviously. The only problem now with this one is this doesn't go into event prop because it's not a uh, integral of a voltage, right? It's, it's not an integral of a function of voltage, it's a function of the integral of the voltage, which isn't exchangeable, unfortunately, right? So mathematically, I, I kind of completely bamboozled myself again. And then it took me a while, but you can actually extend the event prop formalism. I had to go through the whole math again, but you can extend it to also work for functions like this. And I'm not going to show that. And it's a bit of, of mathy things. I'm not sure I have it in there. Yeah, I'm going to just do that. And then, um, <laughs> And then you arrive at something that actually still works on endless. And um, the important one is the sum of V is this new loss function. I also tried some others, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Yeah, so sum of V also works on endless, but importantly, on the spiking Heidelberg digits, it is now also works. So instead of getting 5%, which I left out of this graphics, so it would have been at this level about, yeah. Um, I'm now getting here sum of V. Um, Feed forward or recurrent, you get something in the order of around the 70, 80%. Okay. So, so that solved that particular problem, yeah, the, the destruction of learning. Um, and I, I put even one better on it where, uh, this is the best solution I have, which is actually turning it around and I'm weighting my voltages within the integral again. And the intuition is like the following. Originally, what I had was this thing where the gradient led into spike deletion. By taking the sum, I'm actually just flattening it out. I'm not actually pushing away from it because now it doesn't matter when the spikes in the hidden layer happen. So they're not pushed around at all. And we have almost no learning in the hidden layer. It's, it's, it's this flat situation. Um, whereas this new one with the weight in it is more like this, yeah, the one that I already showed in the other graphics, where you push away and you create good spikes uh, rather than deleting them. Yeah. Okay. So that's the uh, the essence of of it. Yeah. Um, then you can do other things like sequential spiking M list and somewhat uh, competitive. What we get, we don't need to go through the numbers here. Um, and then you publish it, right? Uh, but unfortunately, in the meantime, others have been busy, okay? And, and this is from a recent paper, 2023, there at the bottom. Just, I think it was October 23, so this is last month. Um, I was already aware of what was happening because the earlier, one earlier paper was like earlier in the year. And people came up where they're now suddenly even much better. So I said we were 70, 80%, and I was quite proud to have achieved that because on the spec helper digit, when I did it, it seemed quite competitive, yeah? so. Uh, we're in the table, yeah, that's me there, uh, but only on the top, which is bad on this type of table. You need to be on the bottom, right? Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I had that like, 84% I was quite proud of, but in the meantime, other people have done new things. Um, and it's interesting because we were a bit you know, confused why they can go so much better. They do completely different things, yeah, they use circuit gradients, uh, and they do additional things where they learn time scales, they learn delays in the neurons, all elements of my model that I don't have. But we now believe that that's actually not necessarily the essence of why they are better or, or different. And the essence looks, looks more, um, like this. So this is where I am now, yeah, these, these arrows. Yeah. So I've improved this by 
by the time I, this was reported, it was a bit early. I, I'm now almost 90%. Uh, and on this one, around you know, 70. But if, I, if you look at, uh, Jamie did this, thankfully, uh, the other week. If you look at what the papers are doing, one real difference what they're doing is how they're simulating their networks. So here, delta T refers to how you simulate these continuous dynamics of the network. And it, um, do you notice something of this list compared to that list? Yeah, like these numbers here on the right compared to those numbers, also the ordering, so simply. It's, uh, there seems to be some sort of correlation, right? So the people who go with kind of quite fine grained, except the integration of spiking your networks, they get worse results. And the people who go really coarse down here seem to be getting the best results. And I should then say the typical timescales of what these neurons do, like this tau m or tau sin, like the exponential decay timescales, they're on the order of like 10 milliseconds. So when they simulate it, they're simulating it like one time step for the kind of time scale of the elements in the model, which isn't a simulation of an ODE, right? It is becoming something different. And what we think now is happening is that people have found a way to sell things as being spike neural networks that truly are discretized ANNs. They're basically like ANNs with uh, activations that are discretized to one and zero, they call yeah. it spikes, but it has nothing actually to do with this kind of spike in your nets. I always thought of it, of the ODEs that actually have, you know, silent times in between and so on. Because here, every time step, almost every neuron does something, you know, half of them will spike. It will be very dense and just like this binary arrays of spikes are being processed. So it's a quite, I, I believe, quite different beast. And why does it work better? And it's, this is all speculation, obviously. Yeah? But I think it works better because they have produced something that was a non-time dependency problem with a thousand time steps to something that has only a hundred, where the time dependency are much shorter. And that's easier to learn. You know? And that shows in those results. One of the kind of tiny bits of evidence we have for it is that they do ablation studies and all the new things they report in the papers, the time delay learning, the um time scale learning and so on only adds about two or three percent at most so the advantage they have at 80 percent over 70 percent of 10 seven of that are from the time step and three are maybe the new method they were reporting so it seems a bit dubious right that's it so i won't keep you any longer with any formula this is the summary yeah the picture is the summary really yeah, we need to make loss functions that work with this thing and don't have this kind of trouble with the spike deletions. Um, and yeah, and that's it. Acknowledgements, all the developers of Gen, obviously, and all the funders over the years. Uh, it's all building on having the software. Otherwise, I would be way too slow to try any of this. Yeah, so it, it is important. And supercomputer time, of course, still, even though I want to save energy, I'm burning it at the moment at high rates. So thank you very much for your attention. And we have time for questions, at least a little bit. Fabian, yeah. Yeah, just, so should we, going the last slide, should we then just build a hub and then really go to just um, binary conventional neural networks rather than actual yeah. Well, you could go that way then. Yeah. You would have to see whether you can then build the hardware for those. We know that we can do spiking your networks in my interpretation of spiking as efficient hardware, like the brain scales in Heidelberg, right? They are super energy efficient, but they are like the integrated fire neurons I use, not these coarse grain things. So we would have to find ways of doing those efficiently. I think people are onto this as well, actually. It might well be a different way to do it. Yeah. Well, I had a question too. Well, it was kind of about the same thing. I, I <laughs> couldn't really tell your feelings about using one great time steps. You just mentioned that it's actually not the spike in your problem, but is that actually a problem since these databases were created to show that, okay, this is a problem in which uh, spiking is, is better than using like a traditional RNN or 
tell us your RNN or RNN, and, and it seems like they're performing better in these tests. So why is it a problem if they use longer time steps or if they use these tricks to get better results? Yeah, I'm not sure it's a problem. It's just not the same thing. That's, that's I think, my point. So, and we have a and solutions that work even better, still. Okay. Even right. with spiking high memory distances? Yeah, you can turn them back into images and, mm. <laughs> and do a sequence of images and do LSTMs or something. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe this whole spiking thing is this whole brain inspiration. Obviously, the brain is also more like my spiking than the other spiking. But maybe this whole brain inspiration is a bit of a dead end as well. You don't know. Um, so maybe brains aren't, and they're very efficient, they work very well, but maybe for the other reasons, not for the spiking reason. We, we don't know that. But it's, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not religious in that sense, right? <laughs> I'm kind of fighting for the right spiking neural networks, even though that's the, the stuff I use at the moment. Yeah. But, uh, we need to see. Yeah. It's, it's all kind of open. Chris. Yeah, so I was going to ask if there's any way of explaining in an abstract way why the SHD data set is so much harder than a MNIST, because it made your system completely stop, whereas it chewed through the MNIST. And I was thinking, is it something to do with the fact that in, M in the MNIST data set, uh, spatial relations are important, right, between the dots? That's yeah. important. But in the SHD, it's spatial relations and temporal relations are both important. Um, so is it that basically you've gone up a sort of order of magnitude in terms of, you know, the complexity of the regularities? And then yeah. when you were yeah. talking at the end saying approaches which explore different wintering of the time, um, you know, perform very differently, that sort of seems to suggest that might be that might be the case. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Yeah, so the the reason why it's more difficult is because now temporal relationships play a role. So there's some sort of thing where some sort of high frequency content first and then something low and then high again is different than high, high, low or something. Like, like the sequence matters. But the reason why these the, the cross graining in time seems to work is I think it's not very fine grained. So it doesn't matter exactly when the spikes happen it's, it's more like in this area some activity in these channels and in this area some activity in those channels so you can make it quite coarse and it still works very well and because then you have lesser steps it's easier to learn and my system it does struggle with these longer dependencies if there's a hundred to a thousand time steps between the spikes they can't actually interact sensibly at least not with one layer and I still haven't figured out whether it actually works with multiple layers very well. There's this whole event prop gradient, this exact gradient can suffer from the same problems like all, all systems where the gradient can vanish and explode and so on. It's no different from anything else. And I haven't quite figured out how to do that. So I can't do multiple layers. And that means, okay, I have the recurrent network. It always works better than feed forward. Another indication that timing matters. Yeah. So with the recurrent one, it can have a bit of memory. And then it can work on these timing relationships, whereas the feed forward has only the time scale of the neurons, which is only 20 milliseconds, very little compared to a second, you no know, factor 50 lower. Um, and then it can't work as well. So all these indicators are there. So the timing matters a bit more than in, in MNIS for sure, um, but only coarsely so. And that's the sweet spot for the other methods, and it's okay you know, for, for mine. But uh, you're exactly right with your analysis. No, that's that's the problem. What I'm wondering that so in like if you apply the CNN to the spectral band, you'd be doing spatial aggregation, which in that case is low frequency and temporal aggregation. Yeah. Is there any kind of analog for that within the spike in your level apart from changing the time step? Like could you not just run your ID and then pulse on it or run out multiple scales? Oh, I could, yeah, I could do a lot of things. I could also do what you just said with a spiking neural network, right? I could take the spectrogram mm -hmm. instead of turning each column into spikes and doing them in time. I could take, take the whole thing and unroll it into one big vector and do the MNIST type thing, making that spiking, right? Um, and then ordering issues. classify, yeah, ordering so issues. Still 
pros and then columns. Yeah, but I can just choose whatever I want to do. I would do row wise probably. Yeah. And then if you now need to relate different times, they're just different locations in the mega vector. And then it can do that as well as, as the A and N. I haven't actually done that. I should probably try it. But I suspect it works also quite well. But the idea we have in the head, and that's, that's always this thing. I have this stuff in my head I don't say, but. <laughs> the, the, the things I have in my head is, of course, I want to do something streaming where someone can speak into a microphone and the network's actually doing something while you're speaking. And immediately when you finish, or even it decides itself when, it can decide what you spoke. You can't kind of wait to unroll and then feed it through if you want that streaming kind of operation, right? So in the back of my head, I don't like it so much to, to make an image and unroll it, if that makes sense. It seems a little bit counterintuitive to take a spike in the image. Yeah, it, it seems uh, it seems wrong, right? But but that's what I mean in the back of my head, right? For me, that's wrong, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> but of course, you could do it, and maybe it would work better. Huh? In that sense, is it wrong? Is it, uh, you know, right, wrong? If it works, it works, right? But yeah, you would have to have then some sort of asynchronous operation. You would have to kind of take second snapshots, say that's my image. Let's classify this very quick and then take another second and do this kind of thing, which you could do, but somehow it's less satisfying. And it's not how we, our ears don't work that way, I believe. We don't buffer and then recognize a quick image of our hearing. At least I believe so. I don't know. Who knows what's in there? <laughs> yeah. When you move the integral inside the softmax, it wasn't clear over what time period that integral is, but does that not? interfere with the temporal aspects and because you're, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter what order they come in because it's all going to be inside that. Yeah, well, I guess the uh, the answer to that one is that I'm still operating this whole thing in the kind of forward, backward, phased way. So I have trials and for 1.4 seconds, time unfolds in the network and does things and uh, saves some aspects of its activity. And then I feed it backwards to these backward integral equation, uh, differential equations for 1.4 seconds afterwards to do the gradient calculation, right? And so what happens is that this integral is being calculated once I'm done with the forward calculation. And then that one value that I have at the end, it's being used throughout the backward calculation. It doesn't change in time or anything, so, right? So, so if I said seven, or if I said then seven, yeah. Would the integral be different? I reverse the order or something. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, it, it could be, yeah. Because the, the network, of course, works in a time resolved forward way. So if your S in the seven kind of triggers some neurons that then have a recurrent loop to wait for the seven or whatever, right? That's not reversible. Your N at the end would activate completely different neurons and they would process completely differently. So, so that's not reversible, right? That's, it's only that, that I, in the end, I just look at the evidence over the whole trial as my decision criterion, also for the loss. Oh, yeah, yeah. But just one slightly different thought on the whole energy efficiency thing. And I, so, at least when you talk about the brain, I guess there's quite some evidence that spikes that don't necessarily just contribute to one stream of processing, right? I mean, it could, could be involved in lots of different things happening at the same time or being processed at the same time. Um, with respect to machine learning, I mean, I, I mean, don't know how much research there is going on in whether you can actually sort of overlay different tasks at the same time within the same network but, but that's at least when you talk about spiking networks do you see potential there to say okay let's not just ask can we train this network on this one task and just use it for this one thing intuitively but just more like a sort of parallel processing thing where it, it might actually do multiple things at a time which would potentially reduce the uh, energy consumption per task or per sample. Mm. Um, it's just another. Yeah, thought. I never thought about that. So I'm doing like, mm. 
It's not happy. It's not for every single Yes. Yeah. So even it, though I see a bit of a problem with this code when we talk about actual large scale applications, because then how do you bunch things together <laughs> or requests? Yeah, so so I, yeah, so what you mean is that some sort of multiplexing of yes of problems that all go through the same channels at the same time and they wouldn't interact so much because the spikes are rare and so that you could bunch in more stuff. It's interesting. It's an interesting question. I, I'm not quite sure how you would re-separate things again. Yeah, when you have well, spikes like, from. Yeah. Doing, but, but some sort of at least within the in between stages. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a very interesting idea. I've not never thought about that from that perspective. So that's something new to think about. Yeah. Cool. There was another question here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, action goes. Maybe in a similar direction about the uh, energy efficiency and, and amount of spikes in that thing. Uh, you, your loss function is rate based, basically, right? Because you're saying average voltage. So yeah. The formalism in the beginning, you had both integral of average voltage and a loss spike time. time. So you yeah. also the spike timing based one. Yeah. I think it was also one of the. It was there, yeah. Uh, and it didn't quite work quite as well, but maybe. So with spike timing, with the went spike timing based loss, we do run less into that problem of the the loss trying to generate more or less spikes. And that could in the end also be more energy efficient, right? If you don't try to generate many spikes, but just add the Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think it's more energy efficient to start with that end. Yeah. So uh because you could also in principle then stop the trial at that point and say, look, I've decided. Yeah. So you could take something tight to first spike, yeah, uh, like I tried here, for example, and that might be quite early in the trial, and then you, you save all the rest. Um, the effects on the hidden layer is not so clear how that would pan out, because you still would want the input to the right neuron being maximal, so it spikes early, and you run into the kind of same problems, except for at one time point rather than delayed with the whole thing. So it might actually work okay. Um, but I, in practice, I didn't find it to work that well. And my explanation for it is that um, that you kind of constrict yourself to the early information somehow automatically. You can't teach this thing to wait until it has enough information to make a good decision. It makes an early decision. And that's not as good. as It's quite bad, actually, you know, like 20%. It's not chance, but it's, it's not great. Um, and it doesn't kind of wait for the whole syllables to work out and then makes the decision. So maybe if one could work out a scheme where that was enforced, it could work a lot better, but I haven't figured it out yet. And maybe along a similar line, if you do a rate based loss, could you add some form of regularization that just tells the whole network no neuron can spike too much and they also shouldn't spike too little? Yeah. Or and then maybe also the spike deletion will go away, right? Because if you delete spikes, then you, you take care of that. Hmm. So I'm, I'm doing regularization. I haven't mentioned it because it's a necessity. Otherwise, it just goes crazy. Yeah, especially with a recurring network. It just goes into loops of excitation and uh, everyone goes spike like crazy and you get nothing out of it. So I have regularization terms in there, but it's a bit of a struggle. So most regularization, uh, the only ones sensibly I could come up with were spike number based. And you said it too, right? You wanted not to spike too much. Um, the spike number based regularization doesn't fit into the formalism. So I had to cook it a little bit. So I'm, I'm using a regularization term that I made up ad hoc, which doesn't fit the mathematical formalism for the gradient. And it works, but it's a bit ugly. I mean, it's a bit the ugly underbelly here, but you have to do it. Otherwise, the thing just explodes. So, so maybe taking that as a cue that I can't do it in the proper machine learning way. Just to, to fill everyone in. So normally the proper way is you, you put something into the loss function, like the proper way, the, the one everyone does. Um, you put something into the loss function that uh, ensures that your weight changes are such that you don't do too many spikes in this case. Yeah? So something that hurts the loss, that makes the loss big if there's too many spikes. But if it's based on the number of spikes, it doesn't have the form of these losses that are allowed and also can't easy, easily be turned into that. I tried. But the essential is that just these this formalism doesn't work for spike creation or deletion. So if it's about the number of spikes, which is about creating or deleting them, 
it can't be fit in. Yeah, it's just principally not possible. So, so yeah. So anyway, so, so that way it doesn't work, even though I've done it kind of that way by making up a term that I add to the gradient, which isn't actually the gradient of anything that would be a loss. I, yeah. So, so, mm. but, but to take this as a cue, and you said something about homeostasis, when you take this as a cue, say, oh, if I can't do it the machine learning way this way, why don't I go all the way and go more biological and do a homeostasis into the neurons independent of the gradient? And just don't do it through the learning, but through some other you know, mechanisms, weight homeostasis that I add by hand on top of the gradient. And uh, that could be done. It's an interesting direction. Yeah, I thought about that. Yeah. But definitely regularization is needed. No, otherwise this thing is not going to work. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I thought. Just one more. Um, uh, the gradient free optimization, which is like NCMC. No, I haven't. I haven't. Could be an interesting other direction. It, uh, as, as always, it's, it takes ages to figure one out. So, yeah. And I did do it between our meetings, right? So, <laughs> can imagine it's not too much time. Okay. We've taken long enough, I think. So, so thank you very much for coming.